Guys, let's finish up this rainy week by talking about the tools scientists use to identify species and diagram evolutionary relationships. So evolution leads to amazing diversity of life on Earth, but scientists use certain tools to organize all of that diversity. So phylogenetic trees or cladograms are diagrams scientists use to represent degrees of relatedness between species. So for example, this diagram here shows that salmon are actually, you know, more closely related to shark than they are lamprey, something like that. Okay, so let's look at some of these diagrams. Cladograms show degrees of relatedness, whereas phylogenetic trees show degrees of relatedness and evolutionary time. So if you look at a cladogram, it usually looks like this, kind of like a V. And it might show us that the walrus here is more closely related to a seal than a bear, but it doesn't tell us when those species might have split off or how much more like a seal is it than a bear, okay? Versus this phylogenetic tree right here has all these numbers that represent the relative time that has passed between these different splitting off of the tree. All right, so let's look at how we read these. At the very bottom is the common ancestor. Now, all of the phylogenetic trees on Earth could be combined into a giant one where it represents all the way back to the least or last universal common ancestor. But usually we're just looking at a snippet of that evolutionary tree because it would be a whole lot to look at the millions of species of Earth all at once. So each branch is representing a time when a population was isolated and underwent speciation. Then at the top, you have all of your organisms. And then on the side, sometimes it's listing different characteristics that might have arose over time. So in this way, like if a characteristic was shown right here, it would apply to all three species. If it was shown up here, it would only apply to species C. So for example, in this diagram, the common ancestor was a vertebrate, and then different traits arose over time that applied to everything else that came after. Okay, so crocodiles, birds, and mammals all share a common ancestor that had lungs, whereas, you know, the shark doesn't share that common ancestor. It diverged earlier, but it does share a common ancestor with us that had jaws, stuff like that. Now, cladograms are not always the most accurate. For example, in this one, the mammal is shown right here, branching off before turtles or reptiles. Whereas if we look at this phylogenetic tree that has a lot of the same traits shown, you'll see that it's more accurate showing mammals branching off later on. All right, now modern phylogenetic trees are almost always now based on molecular evidence, so evidence in the DNA. Here you see a DNA sequence and it's showing the parts that are shared in common. If we look at the human sequence and the chimpanzee sequence, you see that it's almost all the same except for right there, okay? And that means that they are closely branched on the tree. Now, if we compare human to gorilla though, gorilla has a lot more differences, but gorilla to chimpanzee, it's got like one difference here, one difference here, but a lot of it's the same. So it's closely related to a gorilla, chimpanzee. And then orangutan is the least like, least related. And I just put this on here for fun, but basically phylogenetic trees can be really broad and look at, you know, vertebrate evolution as a general trend, or it can be really specific, like looking at just the lemurs and all the species of lemurs and how closely related they are. Um, on the island of Madagascar, you actually have a lot of different species that branched off of the original population that is thought to have arisen, um, arrived on the island by being blown across the ocean. But that original population arrived on an unpopulated with primates island, right? And essentially all of the lemurs flourished as different populations took over different habitats. Now, here's the part where it becomes a little bit more relevant to your lives, hopefully. Okay, so phylogenetic trees help us understand evolutionary histories, but they also help us understand diseases. So viruses, even though they're not living things, undergo rapid mutations and divergences, and by looking at the similarities in their RNA or DNA, 
we can understand and branch out those relationships between viruses. And by understanding what viruses, like where they branched off, we can also look at the DNA and the RNA to see what species they might have originated from. Like were they transmitted from human to human, from a bat to a human? Um, we can understand different treatment options. We might understand how they infect humans based on the DNA and RNA proteins that they share. So scientists are actually doing this with the coronavirus. This is a sequence that came out actually in January before coronavirus had spread all around the globe that showed where the COVID-19 human Wuhan virus, um, sorry, human Wuhan coronavirus is located on this tree of other coronaviruses. And if we look at that closely, here's the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which was a few years ago. But down here, you see the Wuhan cases and how they fit in to this larger phylogeny. And you can see that they're more closely related to the bat SARS viruses. Scientists are actually using these phylogenetic trees to understand where the virus originated. And by using this, we can actually see how it did not originate from a lab in China, as some conspiracy theories might suggest. All right, so some funny phylogenetic trees to lighten the mood. SpongeBob one there, baked goods one here. Please pause and enjoy. This one's got lots of lovely little uh, funny things to notice. And the BLT, I thought that one was pretty funny as well. And the last thing that we're gonna cover is that in addition to organizing all the species, scientists want to be able to identify the species. And you might need a microscope to look at some really specific differences of different species, but you can also use a dichotomous key, which is basically a series of statements consisting of yes or no questions that help identify an unknown organism. So for example, if you're looking at a bird and it has feathers, you say, oh, yep. Or you're looking at an organism and it has feathers, then yes, that means it's a bird, and if it swims, hey, maybe it's a duck. This is obviously very simplified. But you can see how it can be drawn in a branch, or it can be drawn like this. Let's look at an example here, okay? We're trying to identify these four birds. Let's start with bird number, or bird letter W. The beak is relatively long and slender. Uh, not, yeah, it's long, okay. Uh, let's say... Certhidia? Do you think that's right? Sure, maybe. Okay, let's do bird X. Let's do a series of elimination. The beat is relatively, relatively stout and heavy. Yes, go to number two. The bottom surface of the lower beak is flat and straight. No, it's curved. Okay, so the bottom surface of the lower beak is curved. Go to three. The lower edge of the upper beak has a distinct bend. No. The lower edge of the upper beak is mostly flat. Platyspiza. Okay, so bird X is that one. Try and figure out birds Z, W, and Y. And I'm already going to tell you that this is stout and heavy. Okay, so that was not Certhidia. Instead, about um, we would go to two. We would see that the lower surface is flat and straight, and that would be Geospiza. Try and figure out bird Z for me. All right, that is it, guys. Um, here is a lovely reminder of where you fit into the lovely tree of life. You're not alone on the world, even during um, coronavirus isolation. All right, hope you guys are doing well, and have a lovely weekend.